Good evening. I'm Ronald Haver from the museum's film department. On behalf of the, our board of trustees and the Museum of Broadcasting, I'd like to welcome you to the Museum of Broadcasting's return to our museum. How's that for a lot of museums? Uh, for their fourth year here, their sixth year back in Los Angeles. Now before I uh, present uh, the people who have something to do with this evening's show, I want to ask you something. First of all, how many people have never been here before? How many people here are not museum, Los Angeles County Museum of Art members? Hmm. How many people smoke? <laughs> well, don't smoke in the theater, please. Uh, and the other thing, two things you cannot do in this theater. It's absolutely um, gauche, smoking and talking. So there you are. And applauding that announcement. That's the other ghost thing. <laughs> the reason I've asked how many people here are museum members is because those of you who are not museum members and have not been here before probably don't know that the museum has an ongoing year-round film program, of which the Museum of Broadcasting event is, as far as we're concerned, the high point. But we do do programming, film programming, for the rest of the other 11 months. And uh, we have a reputation here as one of the premier theaters in Los Angeles for seeing classic films, vintage films, uh, retrospectives, presenting retrospectives, and the kind of material that you cannot see on either the Z Channel or American Movie Classics or any of those wonderful things where you sit at home in front of video. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because at the end of May, no, at the end of March, March 24th and 25th, we are presenting something that is truly unique here in Los Angeles. It is the premiere of the reconstructed four and a half hour version of Fritz Lang's Die Nibelungen. It's a, it's a silent masterpiece, a German expressionist film, and perhaps I am talking to the wrong audience, but if you are interested at all, <laughs> if you are interested at all in great movies and really unique experiences, please think about that. March 24th and 25th, four and a half hours, with an intermission. Uh, German intertitles with a simultaneous German translation. You're all busy reading your programs. All right, the other thing I want to mention is that in regard to the uh, other year-round programming we're doing, we're presenting, starting in April and May, a two-month tribute to the films of Jean Harlow and Marilyn Monroe, which may be, talk about Golden Girls. Talk about Golden Girls, so keep that in your mind. The other thing is that we still have some tickets left uh, in this particular event for the Dennis Hopper event and a few for the Loretta Young evening. And I would urge you all as strongly as possible to get your tickets as soon as you can for the Loretta Young evening. It's the last event in the series and people have a tendency, well, I'll get that at the last minute, but at the last minute there are going to be an awful lot of you disappointed. So those are my only, uh, how you say, warnings. and. Uh, the other thing is that people who are not museum members, our general admission is going to go up starting in April to $6 for non-members. So if you are not members, it might be, don't hiss. It's a, it's a terrible thing and I'm not too crazy about it, but it's either that or cut back on the programming. So uh, it'll stay the same. It'll go up three, uh, 50 cents for museum members. Now that I've ruined your evening, I would like to uh, delight you by telling you a little bit about the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, film preservation is one of our strong points, something we truly believe in here. Video preservation is another area that is seldom uh, done justice to. It's talked about quite frequently, but seldom done justice to. The people who really do the work are at the Museum of Broadcasting in New York. It's a small, dedicated group of people. They locate this material, they preserve it, and they present it publicly in New York and here at the County Museum once a year in March. And I'd like to present to you now the gentleman who more than anyone else is responsible for their success and their ongoing accomplishments, the president of the Museum of Broadcasting, Dr. Robert Baccia. Thank you and welcome to our sixth annual festival. Let me first uh, thank the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for 
uh, being a co-sponsor along with the Television Academy of, of Arts and Sciences. Uh, they have been loyal supporters and have really helped to make this festival possible. Uh, because this is uh, American television and a celebration of American television, I think it's only appropriate that we begin uh, with a commercial, uh, but in this case a commercial of real appreciation. Uh, it's not possible to put on this festival without a great deal of help and, uh, and support. And let me first thank uh, a number of companies on the technical side. Uh, let me first uh, thank uh, Camera Mart, Hoffman Video Systems, Audiovisual Headquarters, Amira Fiorentino. And for those of you who have been to the festival uh, in previous years, uh, you are witnessing something that is extraordinarily dif uh, different this year, and that is our projection system uh, from Ikigami. Uh, twice the number of lines and twice the, uh, the light, and I think the, there's no question about how fortunate we are uh, to have this, and we'd like to thank them very much for uh, contributing the equipment for this festival. Also, we'd like to thank the Four Seasons Hotel for pro providing accommodations and also American Airlines for transportation. Uh, now we go back to our original programming. Um, the uh, f festival is dedicated to uh, creativity uh, in American television. And I think as you uh, look at uh, what the festival has exhibited over the past six years, you really uh, appreciate how exciting and how broad and how deeply creative uh, this medium is. And uh, for those of you who have not been here before, we always begin our festival by showing the museum's signature tape, uh, which gives you a sense, in the first place, of how old we all have become, and in the second place, how rich a part of our lives uh, television uh, is. So if we can have the Through the Years tape, please. Each year when we put together our festival, we try to select programs from the past and current programs that are out for the first season. And in every case, we try and find programs that have really distinguished themselves in a special fashion. And I think there's no question that this evening we're focusing on a very special show, a show that's doing something different, a show that's captured our imaginations, a show that has captured our time and we dare not miss it from week to week. Uh, and it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, the show is put together by uh, an exceptionally creative team uh, and on camera, uh, a, an exceptional uh, cast of, uh, of ladies who week after week uh, put on performances that keep us tuning in week after week. Uh, it's a program that's, uh, that's become a classic uh, and we're very pleased to have uh, the people uh, who are behind this show. And so without further ado, let me introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, the team of Whit Thomas Harris is one of television's most creative and successful uh, production companies. And the team of Paul Younger Witt and Tony Thomas and Susan Harris have created and produced such popular series as Soap, Benson, It Takes Two, Hail to the Chief, Empty Nest, and the program, of course, that we're saluting tonight, Golden Girls. Let me first introduce uh, Paul Witt, who joined the production group uh, that uh, produced here, before he joined the, the group of uh, Witt Thomas Harris, uh, produced Here Come the Brides, The Partridge Family, the award-winning Brian Song, and The Rookies, which earned him in 1972 the Black Image Award. 1976 saw the formation of Witt Thomas Harris, and among the results, as I said, were Soap, Benson, It Takes Two, Hail to the Chief, Empty Nest, and The Golden Girls, which to date has won 10 Emmy Awards and three Golden Globes. Uh, Mr. Witt and Mr. Thomas also produce Beauty and the Beast. Please welcome Mr. Paul Younger Witt. Uh, Tony Thomas began his partnership with Paul Witt in 1971 when he served as associate producer on Brian's Song. The two went on to produce such television series and movies as The Practice, Remember When, No Place to Run, Home for the Holidays, and most recently, It's a Living, Condo, and Beauty and the Beast. And as, the, as they're with their partnership, they have created Soap, Benson, It Takes Two, Hail to the Chief, Empty Nest, and Golden Girls. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Thomas.
Susan Harris is truly one of television's most innovative and acclaimed producers, and she's created such popular programs as Soap, Benson, Faye, I'm a Big Girl Now, It Takes Two, Hail to the Chief, The Golden Girls, and Empty Nest, and she's the winner of two Emmy Awards and a Humanitas Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Susan Harris. Terry Hughes began his uh, career with the BBC, which we won't hold against him. Uh, but since coming to this country, his directorial skills have earned him several prestigious American awards. And for his television ad adaptations of Barnum, Sunday in the Park with George and Sweeney Todd, he won three Ace Awards and an Emmy. He's the director of Golden Girls and has received his second Emmy and a Director's Guild of America Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terry Hughes. Uh, after a considerable period of time uh, in experimental and contemporary theater, Estelle Getty received national prominence for her performance in the Broadway hit Torch Song Trilogy. This true uh, grit is also as manifested in her role as Dorothy's mother, Sophie, Sophia, excuse me, <laughs> uh, on The Golden Girls. Uh, she has uh, not only uh, won our hearts, uh, but she's also uh, gotten a number of awards. Uh, she's received a Golden Glo uh, Globe Award and an Emmy Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Estelle Getty. Rue McClanahan has an extensive career in theater, film, and in television, and she's well known for her previous work on two television series in which she appeared with uh, her two current co-stars. For six years, uh, she played Vivian Cavender Harmon on Maud with B. Arthur, and later she was seen as Anne Fran on Mama's Place, uh, which also featured Betty White. She received the 1987 Emmy Award for Best Actress in, co in a Comedy Series for her portrayal of Blanche the eternal bell in the Golden Girls. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Rue McClanahan. Betty White has appeared on almost every type of television program, including comedies, dramas, variety shows, and game shows. She's best loved for her portrayals of uh, Ellen Jackson on Mama's Family, for Sue Ann Nevins on The Mary Tyler Moore Show, and now as Rose in The Golden Girls, for which, and in all, she has won five Emmy Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Betty White. And B. Arthur has had a distinguished career on Broadway and in television, and her appearances as Maud and All in the Family were so popular that soon afterward she had her own series as Maud, which she, in which she won her first Emmy. 1985, she created the role of Dorothy on The Golden Girls, and last year received her, semi, her second Emmy as Best Actress in a Comedy Series. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Beatrice Arthur. <laughs> I'd now like to uh, reintroduce Tony Thomas, who has agreed to have the courage to speak for this group. 
On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you all for being here, and we truly hope you enjoy the program. We'll see you right after. Thank you. We'll now watch uh, two episodes, and then they'll be up here to uh, answer some of your questions. Can we have the tape, please? Who's got the first question? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, we fake a lot. We just take tiny bites most of the time. Some of us do. <laughs> The, the man who uh, directed our pilot, Jay Sandridge, had directed all the Mary Tyler Moore uh, shows in which I played Sue Ann Nivens. And it was Jay Sandridge, in his wisdom, who said, if Betty plays it, no matter what she does, if Betty plays Blanche, uh, people are going to confuse it with the, the neighborhood nymphomaniac that she played on Mary Tyler Moore. And so he said, why don't we switch the roles? Well, I, I would never have gone as far as Anyone that I know. Personally, <laughs> Scarlett. But it was a joyful, it was a joyful switch because uh, it gave me a chance to, to investigate a character. I had no idea who she was, and Rue has taken that part and just flown with it, and she's just enjoyed it. I just talk like this? Yeah. From my point of view, when I first read the script, when I first opened that pilot and, and read it, I immediately had a connection with Blanche, and I really wanted to play Blanche, and uh, I was being considered for Rose. So when I went in to meet Jay, I didn't say anything, but he just popped up and said, um, would you do something unor unorthodox for me? Would you just take this down the hall and look at the role of Blanche? And I said, well, if you insist. <laughs> and I didn't really have a handle on Rose. I didn't have an instinct for her. She was very similar, I thought, to Vivian on Maud, that airhead. And <laughs> let's be truthful. But I had an immediate feeling for how I'd like to do Blanche, so it, it was just a miracle. And that's all you did? Just take the script down the hall? <laughs> He's not even my type. <laughs> Next question, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think the episode you just saw is possibly uh, it's one of my two or three favorites. So, so I was lucky enough to get an Emmy for it, so I'm, <laughs> I'm partial to it in that way. But it was, it was a, a wonderful script. 
uh, and uh, our writers uh, did a lot with it. It was a, a script that changed quite a bit during the week, and uh, it just got better and better every day. And we and about by Thursday, we started on Monday. By Thursday, I knew we were doing something very special, and then we started getting feedback from people who saw that, uh, and it seemed to work on so many levels. So I think I have a, a particular affection for that. And the one we're doing this week, and the one we're doing next week. <laughs> but that, that's, that's my favorite, I think. Uh, these two that you're seeing tonight, I think, uh, generally are our favorite two episodes, which is why you are seeing them. Uh, but as far as the most memorable moment for me was the taping of the dress of the pilot. It, we were in the middle of that dress and it was like watching an uh, all-star game or watching the Lakers at their very, very best. It was just unbelievable. Uh, Susan's words were, were brilliant as usual. And these four ladies were just running up and down the court, <coughs> shooting everything in the basket and it was, it was unbelievable. There were a couple of guests that we had who were in the business and that's what they said. They said it was like watching an all-star game. It was the most magical thing I've ever been a part of. Hmm. I have to be very careful here because Susan and I are married. So. <laughs> uh, well, without a doubt, it's the pilot. Uh, pilots are very, very difficult to do because not only do you try to tell a story and in comedy try to be funny, but you have to um, give the audience enough so that they, they know about each character. Each character is delineated from the other characters. Um, you have to try to make them fall in love with each character, and it's a very difficult puzzle to put together. Um, they're generally shot in, uh, in, on about the eighth day after seven days of rehearsal or so. And it's a very, a very arduous process. This one was a great deal of fun. The, the script was an, perhaps a perfect pilot script in that it, it accomplished all it was supposed to do. Um, we ran it the first time for a large audience at the Waldorf Astoria in New York after it had been put on the, uh, um, the NBC schedule. And it was in the Grand Ballroom. There were about 2,500 people. And hearing that laughter was probably the biggest thrill of my career. Well, I think for me, it's working with these ladies. Um, you hardly, you really don't have to write for them. They just, they make silence work. They're so brilliant, and it makes it a, a painless process. So any time that I'm writing for them is a joy. Um, as far as episodes go, these, I think, are my two favorites. I was so glad to see them again tonight. I'd forgotten just how good they were. <laughs> but as far as the kind of thing I enjoy doing the most, it's those scenes where we are sitting around the kitchen table late at night, eating the cheesecake and the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> or ravioli, or whatever it turns out to be. And discussing sex. <laughs> Especially when Susan writes it. She knows her sex. <laughs> we talk about sex a lot, but there are obviously a lot of other things to talk about. I can't think of what they are. At this point. <laughs> but, um, I think the second show tonight was such a delicate subject to handle. And it was one where we could have erred in, in so many different directions. And I think with the brilliant writing and the direction, uh, and let's hear it for Lois Nettleton. She had it. <laughs> that it was, it was a joy. And it, I have had a lot of feedback on both sides of the aisle. And no criticism as far as how we handled the, the, the situation. I say we, uh, how the situation was handled. And it was just fun to see it again tonight. I would also say both of, uh, both of these are my favorite, plus the one in where I befriend a man who has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, probably my, my own personal favorite. Maybe it was because it, it happened to me, and I was very touched by it. But uh, I think that when we see them over again, we pick different ones each time we see them, but I love all the bed scenes I have with, uh, with her. Any, anything that has a bed scene with her is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Whenever we're in trouble, mother and I go to bed together and <laughs> that kind of thing. No, there is one script, though, that I don't even know who wrote it. The one where uh, Rose was dating the, uh, oh, the little man. Oh. <laughs> 
touching, delicious things I'd ever, I'd ever been a part of. But uh, anything we do is wonderful. <laughs> I know, I think it's very rare to have the best actors, the best writers, the best director, the best producers, uh, the best costumers. Well, it's an incredible organization and uh, totally without ego. Everyone's, you know, I mean that. Everyone pulls for the product and I think it shows. Take it away. <laughs> Mort Nathan and Barry Fanaro wrote that script, and uh, along with Kathy Spear and Terry Groth Grossman, are, are major contributors to this show. And they're busy back in the office tonight, That's making right. sure that the one that we do this week is good. Go ahead. I guess um, from Susan, could you describe how the concept uh, of the show originated? Well, actually, it originated um, with Brandon Tartikoff and Warren Littlefield at uh, NBC. They wanted to do, uh, they suggested doing a show about um, older women in Miami. And um, I thought I'd retired at that point until Paul came home and seduced me with that idea. Because, <laughs> I, well, not literally. <laughs> um, it wasn't that good. <laughs> There's something, uh, for me anyway, much more interesting about writing about, w about older people. Um, they have stories to tell. Uh, they've lived longer. So I found that very, very compelling and uh, it brought me back. But it, it originated with NBC. Go ahead. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the contribution to the program. It's wonderful for Saturday night and it, I think it, it helps us look forward to the Golden Games, a very pleasant time. Workforce. Secondly, I'd like to ask a question more in line with what Betty was saying about the delicacy of some of the issues that you've chosen to deal with. And I'd like to ask how editorially you make decisions about what is acceptable to deal, deal with and what's not. You've dealt with Alzheimer's, you've dealt with adult children, you've dealt with blindness. Uh, what kind of editorial comments are made? Well, I think any show is going to atrophy the moment uh, the creative people involved shy away from subjects that might be difficult. Um, the things that you've brought up and some other shows that we've done are in fact more difficult to mount. They're harder stories to tell. Uh, the balance between um, comedy and drama becomes a very delicate one. Um, but those are risks that we have to take uh, if we remain a good show, there are risks that we're looking forward to taking in the future. Um, and hopefully we'll always find them uh, and we'll never really edit ourselves or, or censor ourselves uh, within the bounds of, of our own feelings of, of what's tasteful and, and what we're comfortable with. The only issue is can we make it entertaining along the way? Go ahead. Um, on one of your episodes, you mentioned the character of an accountant named Marshall Herskovitz. <laughs> and so I caught the reference to um, the 30-something creator. And then on another episode, you made some joke, uh, a derogatory joke about 30-something, which I think every show on TV has. <laughs> and I was just wondering, I was just wondering, um, are the 30-something the creators friends of yours that you threw in their name? Friends of, friends friends of, the, of the writers. Of the writers. Of yes. Yes. Terry Grossman, of, uh, our writer-producer, is, uh, is a very, very close friend of uh, Chris. And I was wondering, because along that line, you one time made a joke about Murder, She Wrote, which I thought was funny, because you had started with Angela Lansbury um, in May. When you made it, did they make some joke about, oh, she can't. Um, we're, uh, murder, we're equal opportunity offenders. <laughs> I don't think we've missed anybody, really, today. But, you know, it's interesting in how few people in television watch television, and, and yet we know the statistics of what the average American family watches. And so in trying to be representative, um, we have consciously had a, a, the Golden Girls as viewers. It's something that people talk about in their homes, um, whether, it's, uh, whether it's funny, whether it's positive, w w whether it's negative, television is a very important part of our lives, and, and we think uh, it's reflected in our show. Go ahead. I love this show. Could the four of you live together? <laughs> <laughs> now 
Now that would be funny. <laughs> Could we live together or do we live together? We live together a good part of the time, five days a week. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we are all living by ourselves. Each of us lives alone, by choice. <laughs> yes. Yes. It generally takes as long as I have. I can <laughs> stretch it out as, um, yes, I wrote it, but, every, but it, television is a collaborative effort. And so it starts with Paul, Tony, and I sitting down and talking and talking out story. Um, I'll go back and write it. Once we're on the stage, the director has a, a, an enormous part in it. Um, and the ladies add to it in fleshing out the characters. Um, the characters became so much more than I had imagined them and so much more than they were on the page once the ladies had them. So it really is a collaboration. But you know, I think of Abraham Lincoln when I think of that one time. Before my time. <laughs> supposed to have been famous for riding the Gettysburg Address on a train on his way somewhere quickly. We, we had a, a scene that just wasn't working, wasn't working, wasn't working. And they went to Susan and said, you know, something has to be done. And she came in and I think wrote it in pencil on the back of an envelope or something and handed it to us. And there weren't any cross outs or marks or correction. She just wrote it just like that. And it's turned out to be, I think, it was one of those sitting around the kitchen table scenes. At least they told me you wrote that. It's never happened since. <laughs> but it could. But it could. Go ahead. My question kind of ties in with her. How much is it uh, your own words? I mean, do you, the words that you speak, are they literally word for word, or do you add them a lot of it? Us? <laughs> oh, no, there's no ad living. <laughs> no, it's all very carefully crafted. Comedy is a very strange, delicate little animal. It's like a sea anemone. There's a rhythm to it that if you add a syllable, you think it's wonderful, you think you can fake around a line, and you kill the laugh and incredibly. And these, these people to our right have the kinds of ears that can put just the right things in it. So by, by Friday, we make every effort to stick to the ink. But we do contribute along the way until then, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm a great movie fan, and I've seen, I, I'm in love with all the legendary ladies of screen, and they're all going, and I'm so glad to see four more sitting right there. <laughs> Was that a question? <laughs> yes. Uh, I consider your show to have achieved um, something really amazing, and you probably have one of the most diversified audiences of any television show on the air right now. Uh, having been in college when the show went on the air, you all used to, or people I used to listen to, never used to want to go out on a Saturday night until they had seen the Golden Girls. <laughs> Wait till 9.30 until we went out. <laughs> Always. And I think it's really great that people, young people at least, will stay in Stay in and we'll start that night until I see the Golden Girls. It's funny my friends do that, so uh, my hats off to everybody. It's a fantastic show. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Conditioned as why. <laughs> I like the look. Judy mm. likes the look. Also, Miami is a very cosmopolitan city. Uh, the winters can be crisp. Um, 
Dorothy is from the, from the Northeast, um, and you know, rather than have a uniform and very tropical look, uh, which would reflect um, something other than um, urban Miami, we've chosen to go with with a sophisticated look. Go ahead. Uh, right now, I'm not doing television. I'm um, doing a, a feature. Uh, I someday, I'm sure I'll I'll do television. I'll, I'll do the first two episodes of next year's Golden Girls. Uh, but right now, I'm trying something new. But I'll be back. You know, I think. Excuse me. Uh, I think the the names of our other writers should be mentioned. We dis we did. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Why do they show so many reruns at this time, in the height of the season? Yeah. Well, it's just after uh, the sweeps, after the February sweeps. Everybody tries to stay on the air consistently with uh, original programming. And uh, right now, because of the using up all the originals, we have to put on a couple of repeats. Because we have to go down during production, catch our breath, catch up on scripts, get everybody some rest. Go ahead. It's hard to get an 80-year-old lady to come into work every day. <laughs> Sure, you know, when you're an actress, you use everything that you can, people that you know, part of yourself, and uh, it's another character that I play. I've played older, I've played younger. I, you know, if they wanted me to play 16, I would do that. But uh, this is the part I have, this is the part I play as, as an actress. The fact that she's an old lady is just that it's a character role, and it's great fun to do. Go ahead. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry I can't agree with you. I, other than the show that we've just do, seen, I don't think we had one that was thematically gay. Uh, yes, we had one other. We had one this season where... My uh, brother. I think we've only had, we're on show number oh, 98 at the moment. I think we've done two. at the most three, uh, more likely two. We may two. have made mention along the way, but oh, we yes. haven't done any more theme yeah, shows. Yeah, mentions along the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's the, part of life too. In the pilot, uh, the housekeeper was gay. And every, I've had the question addressed a lot about how come you got rid of him immediately? Was it because he was, it wasn't that. It, in those 22 minutes that we're trying to tell a story, there's only room for X number of characters. And we didn't expect the broad, the lady on my left, to come on as strong as she did. <laughs> So the result was, if we had a housekeeper, we couldn't play those wonderful scenes around the kitchen table. You just can't get out there and do that if you have help. So my heart still bleeds for poor Chuck because he thought he had a winner. He was in that wonderful pilot and we had to not use him. And it just, it still hurts. Go ahead. Um, two things. First, I just want to thank you, whoever was responsible for writing the moments last week with the young child who had AIDS, with Sophia. Kathy Spear and Terry Grossman. It was a very wonderful way of dealing with a very tragic subject, and I just wanted to thank whoever was responsible for that. Also, you've done some memory lapse uh, episodes where it's Sophia and Salvador and Dorothy as a younger woman. The woman who's portrayed you is that such a wonderful job. How much time did you have to spend with her to get the gestures and everything down? She just has you perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what you want. She studied, she studied videotapes. Well, well, it was Lynn, Lynn Green, her name is. 
and uh, we, we gave her several um, uh, videotapes which she went away and studied and watched and uh, she's a very clever young lady and she came in and then she was very observant on the set uh, B didn't actually work with her because we thought that might be too restricting no. and would be too limiting for her. It was like seeing myself. Yes, it was probably very difficult to do, but she, her own powers of observation and skills as an actress made it possible. We didn't have direct one-on-one -on -one study, but I'm glad you think it worked. Go ahead. Do you ever, do you get uh, uh, complaints from your male audience about how the males are different? <laughs> I've not heard that. Well, we get a lot of mail uh, of all kinds. We can't please everyone. Um, we would like to, uh, generally, but um, we have we haven't received many letters of of, of that kind. Uh, In this program, you had a, a gang, and then the boyfriend was uh, the uh, bigamist. But we've also had episodes in which uh, each of the women have been uh, very much in love with a, with a particular man for very good reasons and it didn't work out. So I think on balance, uh, uh, we service everyone fairly, or we try to, certainly. Go ahead. Do you ever, show, do you ever plan to show um, the young, a young rose or a young black ever in the future? Has it done it already, or is it just... I would say it's wide open to, yes, it could happen. They wanted, they were trying to get uh, Bo Derek to play a young man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have basically the same staff for the, fir for the first 100 episodes. Um, and some of our people are going to be moving on and, and doing their own shows. Uh, it's, a, it's very challenging for us. It's probably a very, very healthy thing in the life of a show. Uh, healthy for them in their careers and, and healthy for us in terms of getting new blood um, into the company. Uh, yeah, there are all kinds of challenges. I think there are uh, a vast number of stories about um, people this age in this country uh, that within 100 episodes we haven't touched. So um, uh, we're looking forward to all kinds of new adventures. Yes? Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, we don't work with Lucy. <laughs> if, if the occasion arose for us to use someone, it would be a, a great pleasure and honor for all of us. All the way in the back. It's Over a, my dead body. Uh, that's a, a, an unfounded rumor. That was her, that was her agent. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Started. It was the same rumor that had me marrying Christopher Hewitt and Wally Sewell. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> We're getting 
hysteria. Like a, the United <laughs> Nations. That yeah. bilingual channel on KTLA. I want to ask you, Sarah, so when you wrote this pilot, did you have any idea that this would turn out to be the phenomenal success that it did? No, none. I mean, it was just another pilot. When I no. wrote it, it was, it was really another pilot. Um, it, it was a risky subject. I mean, it hadn't been dealt with before. We hadn't address this segment of the population. Um, but once, as Tony said, once we saw the dress show of the pilot, and we saw these ladies, and we saw, we, then we uh, were kind of optimistic. But in television, you, you know, it, it's never a sure thing. And we were still very concerned going on Saturday night if anybody would be home to watch us. Well, could you talk a little bit about the casting? I mean, how you, how you pulled the four? <laughs> Uh, the, the three younger ladies uh, were, <laughs> were the first three people that we thought of, uh, although, in fact, we did um, think of two of them for, for, for other roles. Uh, the network um, had some other ideas, and we discussed them, and went back and forth, but literally the very first people we discussed uh, in uh, in our offices, when, when, with the three of us and Jay, were uh, the three uh, the three uh, 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 first Golden Girls. Estelle walked in, and we didn't know who that was going to be. Estelle walked in red, and that was it. We really didn't have to hear anyone else, and we had them. So it was perhaps the easiest bit of casting and the luckiest because in a given year with with a given pilot. Uh, these ladies could have been busy um, doing other things, and the magic just wouldn't have happened. Who were the other ladies? That, <laughs> that the network mentioned? Um, oh, Derek. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there was a younger way to go. <laughs> yes? Is there any truth to the rumor that Barbara Bush had expressed interest in the <laughs> No. <laughs> that was... Says she did. Hmm? The inquirer says she did. She did. Yeah, <laughs> very strange. You know what you read as you're going through the check stand, and and what actually is factual sometimes are very very different. Uh, she was anxious for us to do something for a particular cause she was involved in, Special but, Olympics. but she did not um, express any real interest in being on the show, at least not yet. Jeff, I'd like to ask just because of the phenomenal cast that you have here how you are able to get such an incredibly talented group of people for all of the shows. So was, you know, my favorite program, and it was horrible to see it go away. It's amazing that the type of people get, and also the, the things that they can do without ever saying a word. Are you, are you pretty much responsible for it? Well, I think we have a tremendous advantage when we work with Susan in that her scripts attract that kind of talent. Um, it's an opportunity to, to work with the very best and say, the very best words that are available on, on, uh, on television. Um, the rest of it is, is hard work and, and good luck. Again, you know, in a given year, uh, you might have a wonderful idea and none of the people that you really want are available. And unfortunately, due to network pressure or, or um, for other reasons, people go ahead with, with the pilots, with casts that really aren't ideal. Uh, we try to wait until we have the people. Yes. Ask you any question about the show if you like asking Michelangelo, you know, how he works. Uh, <laughs> ask, ask. Exactly like that. Exactly like that. <laughs> Seriously, the, the words beyond brilliance come to mind. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Miss Getty one time in public, and she was kind enough to autograph a card for me. It's the only show on television I watch. I watch movies and I take the ball with the movie. Um, she was kind enough to give me an autograph. And I just wondered in your own personal lives, how intrusive is it when people who want to thank you for making us laugh louder and cry more and get in touch with a real joy of life? Um, how is it being the actresses that you are when people come up to you and, you know, intrude into your own time. I love it. <laughs> I think when it's you, wonderful. When you're in this business, you make yourself a public figure, and that, that, those, that goes with the territory. 
and it's nice to know that people care. It's nice when they come up and say that they love you and that they love the show. We're delighted about it. So the ladies will be in the parking lot at the end. <laughs> we have to sign whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. How does the challenge of doing serious television compare to the challenge of doing long run theater? Which many this is the hardest thing there is to do. This is the hardest form there is to master. It takes more than talent, it takes real craftsmanship. And, and real guts a and lot talent. of nerve, <laughs> a lot of courage. It's the hardest yeah, thing. Yeah, it is. It, uh, I'll tell you something, what it takes is a very good director like Terry Hughes to keep it together every week. We're very fortunate. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'd like to just comment first about every time, every Monday, I come to school and I, every day I talk about what happened to uh, uh, Rose and what happened to Dorothy on Golden Girls. And we all laugh and stuff at lunchtime and stuff. <laughs> Great. That's good to you. What grade are you in? What? What grade are you in? Six. Six? <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> One of the great, great joys we had when, when the first research came back uh, and the show had been on for several weeks and we saw that we were reaching such uh, a, a broad spectrum in terms of audience, but especially in terms of, of young people, um, it was uh, uh, very exciting for all of us and very meaningful. And it's an audience that we care a great deal about and hope we can continue to please. Did you have a question that you wanted? Go ahead. And I wanted to have a question because the chemistry between the four of you is so incredible. What are some of the joys of working together and also what are some of the difficulties? <laughs> They're the same. <laughs> if we I, laugh a lot. If I may address that, it was one of the most exciting things in the world was um, having been in the business as long as, as we all have, to come together and be with three other pros that no matter what you threw out, you got something batted right back over the net and you better be ready for it because it was gonna go by you. <laughs> and it is really the most exciting. We didn't expect to fall in love personally as much as we did, but going in professionally, it still is one of the most exciting things that's ever happened in my life. No, I, it's, I think it's very, very rare uh, that you get a company together where there, there really is no weak link at all. I mean, everyone is strong, and it's, it's lovely. It's and just can a you imagine choice. a director having to handle four dragons yeah. like this? <laughs> Would the well, director like to comment? <laughs> no, I, I just... I have learned so much from, from, from working with the ladies. And our scripts are, are generally and mostly, as, as we've said, in such good shape. But what's really wonderful is to see them take a piece of material, which may be less good than, than what we normally have to, to deal with, and see them invest it with a quality and a meaning and uh, an importance that raises above the mere words on the page. Uh, and I see that grow during the week, and I feel very privileged to, to see that happen. And then by Fridays, it, it's, it's, it's really working. And uh, that never ceases to be a, a very special thrill every week. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that experience. Yes? Um, of all the comedies on television, I've always felt that Golden Girls was um, the most topical. With jokes about people like Donna Rice and Fawn Hall, and especially Jared Falwell going down the water slide, um, is it a conscious decision to set yourself apart like that? And looking down the road, say 10 years from now, do you think it'll hurt the show in syndication? What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it is. Uh, it, there is a, an, a conscious effort made to be topical. Um, uh, I think in terms of syndication that uh, we certainly hope it, it won't get in anyone's way. Uh, a lot of people are gonna watch these episodes over and over the way we do now with, with some of our favorites. And um, uh, I think most people will, will remember the, the references and there are not so many of them that it would get in the way if, if a, a, a somebody didn't understand a, a particular joke. 
I can vouch for that because the show is hugely successful in England, uh, and they don't know who was also there, who Donna Rice was, sure, but there are a lot of people that we hit at that they don't know, and it doesn't seem to affect the show's one iota, so I, I don't think it, it matters too much. Yes? Um, just a question to Miss Arthur, or actually a statement to Miss Arthur. I remember one of my favorite parts of your character in Maud was your stare. Was what? Your stare when Walter would say something, or Vivian would say something, or Arthur would say something so stupid that the next thing out of your mouth had to be a, 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 an amazing comical line. You just stare at them and nod for about five or ten seconds. And the audience would be laughing hysterically, knowing you were going to say it. And I catch the same, I catch the same thing, and that's one of the things I love about your repertoire. I mean, that's one thing I loved about you on Maud. And I see a lot of that also in the Golden Rose, and that's that's what I love about you too, is that you just once Rose says something, you just nod. Yeah. <laughs> I think anyone would respond that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't hear you. Uh, I do. <laughs> we, uh, as we go during the week, uh, we uh, make up a camera script, and that has every every shot. And in most shows, it's about uh, uh, 250 to 275 shots, and each one is specified very clearly because, as the gentleman was saying just now about uh, when B looks at Rose. We too know the power of that and the effect of that. So not only is it written for, we stage it for that and we shoot it for that. So everything is, is, is very precise and uh, it, it doesn't change very much. By the time we shoot that on Friday, that's pretty well what you see on the screen. Of course, we probably have two minutes more we have to cut out in those snips, but it, everything that, that you're responding to and it's, it's thrilling to hear it are things that we we play to and work to, and they're not accidents. So, so that's how the choices are made. It seems like a lot of times the reaction back to a line from one of the characters really brings in a big laugh. It's reaction comedy. I mean, that's, that's generally that's what it's known as, and we use it, and uh, B is a master at it, and we, we, we use it. And I'm glad you've noticed it, and uh, we'll go on doing it. Keep watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy. Um, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and I also like <laughs> the kind of wonderful self esteem that Blanche has. She's so full of herself, and she's <laughs> so optimistic. She's so upbeat, and really enjoys life. And a lot of that has uh, rubbed off on me. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful, glorious experience finding the things in me that are Blanche, that can be Blanche, and then letting them develop a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see her have some kind of real uh, awakening in some area that uh, where she's uh, prejudiced or um, afraid or something. I'd like to see her make a big step forward in her develop, you know, in her emotional development. Exactly what I don't know, but I kind of feel like that would be interesting to explore. When we were in England, uh, someone brought up in an interview <coughs> something that I had not thought of, and I found it to be a very interesting. Uh, angle. They said that Rose was, as dim as she was, was there serving a function of if in case the, the plot of the show got a little uh, complex, can you still hear me? In case the uh, plot of the show got a little complex, by explaining it to Rose, they more or less could explain it to the audience as well. <laughs> meaning it to be funny, and then I realized that I was so dim, I hadn't realized that that was wrong. <laughs> but it's 
an interesting thought. <laughs> I have no problem. My, my character is perfect. I can say anything, do anything. <laughs> And I have. I don't know where, where else I can go. I've offended everybody in the whole universe. That's the uh, I think the character is so marvelous because we can go any place with her. And I've had love affairs. And I have my children. I have my grandchildren. I live with these wonderful women. I just say and do anything I want. The character is perfect. Just perfect. Yeah. Uh, of course, I really feel that uh, if I were not in the group, the whole thing would go to hell. <laughs> the only truly sane one. <laughs> I, I love her. I think she's a juicy, delicious character. That's it. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that it's time to bring this to a conclusion, but I couldn't think of a, a better moment. It is a, it is a wonderful show. I think if ever you had any doubts, they were relayed this evening, oh, and uh, it's, a, it's a golden show. Thank you for putting on the show, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.